Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Glad to see you all here. If you could stand with us, those of you are who are <coughs> standing already. It's always nice to see new faces. Are they smiling so the camera? <laughs> <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for yet another day and another week that you have allowed us to see that you have brought us through. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that you extend to us new each and every morning. We are so grateful for your love and your kindness. We just ask that you would be with us, bless each person here, that they will feel your love and your warmth. In Jesus' name, amen.
if we will be able to stand or speak or just kneel or lay prostrate all over, just in your glory. God, that's just such an awesome, awesome thing to think about. And we ask that you would help us to be bold, get out there, and bring people along with us. Let's not just keep this a secret. Let's not keep your salvation a secret. Let's be go out there and, and build disciples just as you commanded us. Give us the strength and the courage, the words to say, and the timing. Sometimes we want to say things and it's not the time. So God, help us to hear your voice and let us know when to go out there and when to go so that we can have more brothers and sisters in Christ and they can experience this joy that we have. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. We ask that you would prepare us for the word that you have from Pastor Fernando Tushia, that he will bring it to us in the way that you would have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. Our annual business meeting is today after church. Um, we'll probably take a minute to just kind of see people socialize before we back up to the meeting so we'll reconvene and um, have our meeting. Uh, this Wednesday, as usual, our regular Wednesday service starting at 7 o'clock prayer and Bible study and youth downstairs. And then on April 15th is Good Friday, and we are having a candlelight service on that uh, Friday evening, starting at 7 o'clock. So we welcome you all to come on out. April 15th, Friday, April 15th, Good Friday at 7 o'clock, we will have a candlelight service. That is all I have. You are in the capable hands of our pastor, Fernando. You are the blessed gift. Lord, good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> my legs. Uh, so praise the Lord. Just to echo uh, what Juanita said, we are having our business meeting right after service. Uh, we do not have anything to vote on. Uh, this is going to be strictly informational, so it will not take long. Uh, 15, 20 minutes, unless you guys have lots of questions, but... Uh, yeah, you'll get to see how the church has been doing financially this past year, uh, and I'll give my report for the year, so, and then we'll be on our way. <clears throat> so praise the Lord. Uh, I want to continue our series on uh, God's promises in the New Testament. Now, we've already uh, gone through three of God's promises, some of the more important promises. We started with the most important promise, and that is the promise for forgiveness, we are promised by God that if we repent and, and turn to him, that he will forgive us of our sins. And then we talked about the promise of comfort, comfort in our sufferings, comfort when things go wrong. And we talked last week about the promise of peace. So who couldn't use a little peace nowadays, right? Amen to that. Well, now today I want to talk about uh, something that flows naturally from those three. Uh, once you have been forgiven, once you have been uh, received comfort and peace, uh, God also promises you freedom. Now, when I say freedom, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Freedom does not mean that you can do whatever you want without consequence. See, that is the lie that the world tells you. Like Jesus said last week uh, when he talked about peace, he said, when I give you peace, I don't give you as the world gives, right? Jesus gives us a different kind of peace. What's well, the same thing with freedom? Jesus gives us a different kind of freedom. <laughs> See, the world promises the kind of freedom that allows you to do whatever you want, and there's no consequence. Well, we know that that's not true. Every choice you make brings a consequence. If you make good choices, most of the time, good things are going to happen. If you make bad choices, most of the time, bad things are going to happen. When you make a choice, see, that's the thing about free will. When you make a choice, you're not just choosing the action, you are also choosing the consequence. Now, that the kind of freedom that God is offering you is not a freedom from consequences, but it's a freedom from a life filled with negative consequences. And there is a difference. Galatians 5, 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke 
of slavery. Do you, do you realize that before you came to Jesus Christ, you were a slave? You were enslaved. You were enslaved to your desires. You were enslaved to your feelings. You were enslaved to the flesh. And as we've said before, I've, I've said this many, many times before, when you try to satisfy the flesh, you're going to find that the flesh never is satisfied. It doesn't matter what you do. And that's the thing about the world. See, the world tries to offer you an all-you-can-eat buffet, right? Now, look, all-you-can-eat buffets are great. I've indulged in a few. But you can't eat at an all-you-can-eat buffet all the time, right? And why is it that whenever you go to a buffet, you always tend to gravitate to the bad stuff? I mean, who goes to an all-you-can-eat buffet to eat salad, right? <laughs> Certainly not me. But see, that's what the world is offering you. See, the world says, oh, you can do all that you want. You can have anything you want to eat all the time. And you know what's going to happen to you when you go to a buffet day after day after day after day? You're tired. Well, you get, you get tired, but you're also going to be very unhealthy. You're going to suffer high blood pressure. You're going to suffer from sleep apnea. You're going to suffer from all kinds of diseases related to that kind of eating. That's why eating healthy actually is truly uh, freedom-inducing. Because when you eat healthy, you feel better. Now, I've experienced this recently in my life. I've lost a little bit of weight, been eating healthier. Now, I've changed my diet over, over the course of years because I'm hard-headed. And it takes me a really long time to change things. Now, you be quiet over there. <laughs> it takes me a while to make changes, but I have changed my diet over, over the course of years. And it is amazing the difference in how I feel. Now, I used to be, quote unquote, free to eat whatever I wanted. I could eat fried chicken, I could eat, you know, whatever. I could eat cake and, and, and cookies. And, oh my God, I love cake and cookies. But, <laughs> but I had so many issues. Look, you guys may not believe this, but at one time in my life, I was 245 pounds. Now, to put that in perspective, I'm five foot six. Five foot six, and I weighed 245 pounds. And I had all, <clears throat> all of the health problems that come along with that. <clears throat> I had sleep apnea. I could not sleep. Matter of fact, do you know what sleep apnea is? It means you stop breathing when you're sleeping. And my doctor tells me, or told me at the time, that you are at a much higher risk of stroke and heart attack when you have sleep apnea. So that was a consequence of all the quote-unquote freedom that I had. That I was probably going to die before I hit 50 years old. And so I discovered a new kind of freedom. I discovered a f the freedom that brought me grace. You guys know how much I do for I discovered the kind of freedom that comes from eating in moderation and exercising regularly. And now, I actually can sleep. And I never understood how important sleep was until I actually was able to sleep. Because, you know, you start sleeping poorly and you just get used to it. You just get used to feeling tired. You get used to feeling sluggish and, and having to push through that. But when you get a good night's sleep after being unhealthy for a long time, it is a revelation, folks. I'm like, I actually have energy. Sometimes I have so much energy, I don't know what to do with myself. I'm like, I've got nothing to do. I've got to find something to do. But see, this is the kind of freedom that Jesus is talking about. It's the kind of freedom that gives you good sleep. The kind of freedom that gives you energy. <clears throat> have you ever talked to somebody? And, uh, or even for yourself. Have you ever talked to someone who has a habit? Like maybe they uh, they get angry very quickly. I used to say this all the time because I had a really bad temper for a very long time. And you ask them why they did something, and their answer is, well, I just couldn't help it. It just happened. Now, we've all said that, I'm sure, at one time or another, right? You know what that is? That's bondage. That's the bondage of the flesh. 
People don't understand that. When you say stuff like that, when I would when I would blow up at people, and I would think to myself, well, I just couldn't help it. That's the bondage of the flesh. You are bound by that sin. And now Jesus, when, when Jesus talks about freedom, he is talking about freeing you from those things that happen just because or they just happen. <clears throat> In John chapter 8, verses 34 to 36, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now this is very interesting because the Greek word for indeed here is the word antos. And it means truly, in reality, in point of fact, as opposed to what is pretended, fictitious, false, or conjectural. This is real Freedom. See, when the Bible says that when the Son sets you free, you actually have real freedom. Just like when I started eating healthy, I started to experience real freedom in my life. For the longest time, I was bound because I couldn't sleep and I was unhealthy and I just had no energy to do anything. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to hang out with anybody. I didn't want to do anything. That's not freedom. I may have been free to eat whatever I wanted, but that freedom was taking away the rest of my freedoms. Jesus is talking about real freedom. In point of fact, now I actually am free. Because I have energy. I can get up and do all of the things that I need to do and want to do. That's real freedom. <clears throat> See, the world is perfectly happy to pat you on the back and, and watch you as you fall into hell. See, that's a lie that they tell you. See, they, 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 they tell you that they're on your side. And they'll pat you on the back right up until your life starts falling apart. And then where is the world at that point when you need help? Where is the world at that point when you are suffering the consequences for your sin and for your indulgences? See, I, I discovered this a very long time ago. I have very few friends. I'm going to say that. People that I actually call friends. I have a lot of acquaintances. I have a, a, you know, people that I know and that I actually care about. But when I call somebody a friend, I have very few actual friends. You want to know why? Because I discovered something. I discovered that the most valuable friend you can have is a person who's not afraid to look you in the eye and tell you you're doing something wrong. I don't need those friends who are just going to pat you on the back and say, hey, whatever you want to do, man. It's cool. <laughs> See, I don't like that on my board either. I, I've told you guys this before. I have a, a board here at the church who advise me on church matters. And if there's one thing I do not want on my board, it's a bunch of people who are just going to agree with everything I say. Now, that may come as a surprise to you. Now, I've known pastors who are, who are not like that. They'd rather just have a board that goes along with them. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that I don't like that. See, because I have realized that I'm not the smartest person in the world. I know, I'm shocking you. It's okay. <laughs> and I need good counsel. And the only way I'm going to get good counsel is by talking to people who have different perspectives from me. And who will disagree with me. Because if you disagree with me, it's going to make me go back and think, well, wait a minute. I didn't think of that. Does this change how I think about this subject? And that's what a wise person does. See, a wise person seeks out that kind of counsel. But the world doesn't treat us that way. See, the world's just going to pat you on the back. Oh, yeah, whatever you want to do, whatever makes you happy, it's okay. As you're, as you're hurtling down the road towards a cliff. And, never, and nobody's going to warn you. See, but Jesus loves you. Jesus is going to warn you when, when the bridge is out and you're about to go off a cliff. That's what, real, that's what real love does, right? That's the freedom that Jesus, that Jesus offers us. It, it's real freedom. It is, in fact, freedom, not that fictitious freedom that the world is offering us. <clears throat> now, there are three things. There are responsibilities that we... Uh, that we have to take on. There are three things that we have to do in order to gain 
this freedom. No, the very first thing that we have to do is we have to believe the truth. John 8, 31 and 32 says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, the connotation here in the Greek, when it says that you will know the truth, it, is, it, it has a connotation of being resolved. Not just knowing something, but being resolved to act on it. See, how many times have we talked about faith, right? Faith isn't in what you say you believe. Faith is in how you act on what you believe. We go back to Abraham. Abraham was the father of faith. Why? Because when God said, get up from where you are, leave your family, leave your country, and go to the land I'm going to show you. The Bible says that Abraham believed God. How do we know that Abraham believed God? Because he got up and he left his country. If Abraham had said, oh, I believe you, Lord, and stayed where he was, then we wouldn't read in the Bible that Abraham believed God because we know that he, he did. So it isn't what you say you believe. There are too many people in this world who say they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but do not believe what he had to say. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you are my disciples. See, disciples aren't the ones that say, oh, I'll follow you wherever you go. And then when Jesus goes someplace difficult, they're like, well, I'm not going to follow you there. I mean, you didn't tell me this was part of the deal. And that's the trouble with most Christians. We don't understand that part of the deal sometimes is being ridiculed for our faith. Being attacked for our faith. Now, we're fortunate we live in America where people don't physically attack us yet for our faith. But there are plenty of places around the world where Christians are physically attacked for their faith. It amazes me sometimes what these Christians go through. And you know what they'll say when you talk to them? I've, I've seen this before. Uh, ministries that work with the persecuted church. And, and you know when they talk to some of these Christians, you know what they say? They pray for us here in America. They pray for us here in America because our faith is so weak. Our faith is so weak. We can't deal with the slightest inconvenience. Not even issues or problems. I'm not even talking about real problems. I'm talking about inconveniences. We can't deal with inconveniences. We want to change and turn around and, and, and renounce our faith. And yet these people are being attacked. They're being killed. They're being, uh, they're being uh, uh, imprisoned just because they name Jesus Christ as Lord. And they believe the Bible is the word of God. Jesus said, when you know the truth, when you are resolved in the truth, that's what sets you free, folks. See, you know that eating an all-you-can-eat buffet is not healthy for you. But if you go to an all-you-can-eat buffet over and over and over again, the fact is you are not resolved to the truth of healthy eating. So Jesus said, it doesn't matter. It, we're not talking about a head knowledge here. We're not talking about something that you can quote. I can quote the Bible all day long, but if you don't see me living it, it doesn't mean anything. As a matter of fact, I, I can tell you, uh, I, know, I know several people who probably know the Bible better than I do. They're not living according to it. There are plenty of people who can quote the Bible to you. But are you living it? Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, then you are my disciples. Then you're going to know the truth. And the truth will set you free. The truth is that I have to eat healthy if I want to be healthy. As much as I hate it. But I do it because I am resolved in the truth of healthy eating. In the same way, I am resolved in the spiritual truth of Jesus Christ and the inerrancy of his word. And sometimes that's inconvenient. Sometimes that means I can't do what I want to do. My flesh, my flesh wants to do a whole lot of things that the Bible says I shouldn't do. And so I have to be resolved in the truth. I can't make excuses 
We're, we're great at that, aren't we? We're great at making excuses. Oh, God, I'm just sorry. Oh, God will forgive me. God will forgive you. But there are consequences for willful sin. When you knowingly rebel against His will. That's what we're talking about. See, that's the kind of freedom God wants to give you. He wants to give you the freedom. He wants to give you the freedom from those kinds of consequences. And from the ultimate consequence, because Jesus said, or, or the Bible tells us that it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Now, I don't talk a lot about the judgment, because I'm not one of these preachers that, that, that likes to use scare tactics. But don't be, don't be fooled, folks. There will be a judgment. We are going to stand before God. I want to know, how are you going to feel in that moment? I don't want to be scared in that moment. There's going to be a whole lot of people standing before God and wishing they had done things differently and just absolutely terrified of that moment. I want to stand in that moment and go, yes, I'm theirs. That's freedom. That's the freedom that Jesus is talking about. That I can stand before God and go, yes, Lord. I believed your word. And I proved it in, in, in how I lived my life. No, I'm not perfect. Shocking you again, right? No, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We all mess up. God understands that. God understands that we mess up. He doesn't understand willful sin. When you know something is wrong and you're just like, I'm going to do it anyway. That's not freedom. Because once you suffer the consequences for that, you're going to understand how, how uh, bound you are. Because you allowed yourself to be to to, to be uh, enticed by the flesh. Second thing that we must do once we know the truth, we must repent. Now that is something I will tell you over and over and over again. Because when Jesus started his public ministry, he started it with that word, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, repentance. We talked about forgiveness in the very first part of this uh, sermon series. Repentance brings forgiveness, and forgiveness brings its own freedom. Have you ever done somebody wrong, and you knew you had done them wrong, and you went, and from your heart you sincerely apologized, and they actually forgave you? I think that's a rare occurrence nowadays, right? People aren't very forgiving anymore. But have you experienced that where, where someone actually says, you know what, I forgive you, and they actually mean it? Oh, it's like a weight that comes off your shoulder. It is, it is just, I, I mean, I can't even describe it. We've all, I'm sure, I hope we've all had that experience. But it's like once you understand that that person really does forgive you, it's like, oh, thank God. It's a relief. Well, now multiply that by a million times. Because God, when you go to God and you say, Lord, I know I've been living wrong. I know I've done all of these things to offend you. I know I've done all of these things in rebellion to you. But I want to serve you, God. I'm so sorry. And God reaches out and says, you know what? I forgive you. You know what the Bible calls that? The Bible says that we have peace with God. So that when I stand before God and on that day, Oh, it's going to be a great day. Because I have peace with God. I don't have to feel like it. That's freedom, folks. That's real freedom. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Do you know what no condemnation means? It means no condemnation. And that includes the inner condemnation. 
Because a lot of times we bind ourselves by the things that we have done. And we, we spend so much time regretting those mistakes. Say, Lord, why did I do that? Or, oh, you're so stupid. You shouldn't have done that. And Jesus says, there is no condemnation. I am not going to condemn you. And you should not condemn yourself any longer. Now look, you have a responsibility if you've hurt people. And you can somehow make that up. You have a responsibility to do that. But once you have, once you've done all that you can do, Jesus says you can be free. You no longer have to condemn yourself. You no longer have to live in that kind of bondage. God sets you free from the condemnation of your mistakes. And that is real freedom. I've made so many mistakes in my life. I've hurt so many people in my life. And not every one of them have I been able to go back and make amends. There are some people I will never be able to make amends to. And if I could, if I get the opportunity, I will. But you know what? Dude, but you know what I don't do? I don't spend any time beating myself up over that anymore. Not because it didn't matter. I know that it mattered. And like I said, if the opportunity comes, I will make amends. But I know that I've been forgiven. And I know that today I'm a different person. I'm not the same person that, that I was 20, 25 years ago. I don't even recognize that person anymore. And there is freedom in that. There is real freedom in knowing that, you know what, I may have made that mistake before, but you're out. You're never going to repeat it. It's never going to happen again. Not not in because of anything that's good in me, but because Jesus Christ has converted me from the inside. I don't even have the same feelings or thoughts that that person used to have. I think differently now. I actually like people now. So I'm not going to hurt people anymore. Joel 2, 12 and, 3 and 13 says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. You know, I wanted to read that from the Old Testament because we have a tendency to believe that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. But over and over again, the Old Testament tells us that God is abounding in love. He is rich in mercy. He is patient. You know, we focus always on the punishment of the Old Testament. We don't focus on all the years that God spent calling to, to people to repentance. The Israelites made a covenant with God, and they violated that covenant. covenant. And for years, for generations, God literally begged them to come back. He sent them prophet after prophet after prophet and said, come back to this covenant. Come back to my love. I don't want to punish you. But they continue to rebel. That's the same God we have today. That is the same God who suffered on the cross for us. And he tells us the same thing today. He's like, come to the cross. Come back to my love. Come back into relationship with me. I will free you from the consequences of your sin. I will free you from the bondage of your flesh. We are so stubborn. And we keep going the same way that we've been going. What's that old saying? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. We got a lot of insane people, even in the church. They keep, and, and I've met them, okay? I've met these people, and I, I, I cannot tell you how, many, how frustrated I get sometimes when somebody comes to me and they say, Pastor, I did this, and I suffered this consequence. I'm so sorry, and, and please pray for me. And I pray for them, and, and God restores them. And like a month later, I say, oh, Pastor, I did this. And, and I just want to shake them sometimes. Because God is telling you, you know what 
repentance means? It means turn around. That's it. It's a very simple word. I know we, you know, it's a Christian, you know, kind of Christian theological word, repentance. No, it's just, all it means is, look, I'm walking in the wrong direction. It's like, oh, wait, this is the wrong direction. You turn around and you start walking in the right direction. See, people don't do that. People think that repentance is you're walking in the wrong direction. It's like, oh, I'm walking in the wrong direction. I'm so sorry, Lord, and you keep walking in the wrong direction. That's not repentance. Repentance means that you are actually changing your direction. And Jesus said, if you repent, he is going to be gracious with you. He is going to be compassionate with you. He relents from sending calamity. He doesn't want to punish you. He doesn't want you to experience the consequences of your sinful behavior. So he wants to free you from that. And finally, and this is the most important and most difficult step, we've got to crucify this flesh. Romans 6, 6 and 7 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. You know, because we don't crash crucifixion, we forget what, what a brutal death crucifixion really is. And yet this is ex exactly the image that the New Testament Jesus Christ used when he was talking about sin and flesh. We have not, we don't just, uh, we don't just change our minds. See, we talked about repentance, right? Repentance is just changing your mind, changing your direction. Okay, that's the first step. But Jesus says you've got to go a step further. further. You've got to crucify that flesh. You've got to put it to death in the most violent manner possible. Why do you use that? That's what you should be thinking that to yourself. Why is why such violent imagery? It's very simple, guys, because Jesus wants you to understand how serious this is. This is not a joke. Unfortunately, in the church, we don't take sin seriously anymore. There are too many churches that that because they want to be inclusive. They don't take sin seriously. But the Bible takes sin seriously. Jesus took sin seriously. He told us, you have got to take up your cross every single day. Every single day, you've got to nail that flesh to the cross. Because when you don't, it's going to come up and it's going to rear its ugly head again. You've got to put it to death. You've got to hate it so much that you want to nail it to a cross. We just don't think that way. We tend to think of, of, of sin in, in, in terms of God's mercy. And yes, he is mercy, merciful and compassionate. But because of his compassion, we sometimes forget how serious it is. Sin separates us from God. Complete separation from the one who created us. It's like, it's like taking a newborn baby away from its mother. Try doing that with a bear cub, right? <laughs> See what happens. But that's the, kind of, that's the kind of violence that we're talking about. You are separated from the God who created you. And you are in danger. Can I, can I, can I, can I stress that enough? You are in danger. Because in the judgment, there is no understanding. In the judgment, there is either sin or there is forgiveness. That you are either going to pay for your sin yourself, or you are going to plead the blood of Jesus to pay for it for you. Those will be your only two choices. It's too late for repentance at that moment. And that's why God wants you to take sin seriously. He wants you to take it so seriously. He uses the image of crucifixion. Look that up someday when, you, when, when you're not feeling uh, uh, too queasy in your stomach. Look up crucifixion. And understand what a brutal death this really is. And Jesus is telling you, that's what you've got to do to your flesh every single day. Because that's the only way you're going to conquer it. Look, we 
live in the flesh. Our flesh is going to influence everything that we do if, if we're not careful. I mean, look, it, it doesn't have to be sinful. I mean, it happens in the church all the time. How many times have you prayed for something you really want? And then you go out and you do all that you have to do to get it. And then you go, praise God, the Lord answered my prayer. No, no, you answered your prayer. Because that's the flesh. The flesh is like, I really want this. So this must be God's will. No, no, we got to crucify that and see, well, look, maybe it is God's will. I'm not saying it's not. Whatever it is you're praying for, I'm not saying it's not God's will, even if it's something that benefits you. I, I, you know, maybe I should talk about the opposite, right? Sometimes we, we think that because something's good for us, it can't be God's will, that somehow we always have to suffer. No, 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 no. Sometimes God does want good things to happen to you. I would say all of the time, God wants good things to happen to you. See, that's the benefit of all, of all that we're talking about. We're you know, going back to the subject here. He is talking about setting us free. God wants you to have good things. But you've got to be in, you've got to be so in tune with God that you, you, you've crucified that flesh. So that flesh is never going to interfere with, with uh, God's messaging to you. It's never going to interfere with that relationship that you have with him. So that when he does talk to you, you hear him clearly. It's an amazing thing when, when, you, when you hear the voice of God and you know that it's God. Like, ooh, yeah, 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 I know that's God. That is an amazing thing. And I want every one of you to experience that. But see, God's not going to talk to you as long as you're ruled by the flesh. You've got to crucify that flesh. And when you do, when you do, God, God is able to pour his spirit on you. 2 Corinthians uh, 3, 12 through 18 says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Praise be to God. That's the good news. See, that's the freedom that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying that if you crucify that flesh, you can come into the life of the Spirit. And the Spirit is going to make you more and more like Jesus. And that's what we want. I want to be like Jesus. I want to love like Jesus loved. I want to heal people like Jesus healed people. I want to see people the way Jesus saw people. The only way you do that is by getting in tune with the Spirit of God. God promised us the Spirit. Even back in the Old Testament. He said that in the in the new, when, when the new comes, I will pour out of my spirit on all people. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. God, God uh, completed his promise. And he still does that today. He promises you the infilling of the Holy Spirit. If you crucify that flesh, you can live in harmony with the Spirit of God. The Spirit guiding you to the right path, to the right choices. So that you can live in the kind of freedom that he is offering. Do you want it? Is the question. Do you want that freedom? Or are you going to stubbornly cling to what you've been doing? And what you feel? And what you think right now? Are you willing to turn to the truth? Not just know the truth. But be resolved in the truth. Are you willing to rip? And are you willing to crucify that flesh? 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through, 4, 12 through 14 says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. 
Praise be to God. See, he is a God of resurrection. You are dead in your sin, and yet God wants to make you alive. He wants you to truly live. See, that's what Jesus promised. He said, if you, you know, that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come to give you life. And not just any life, but an abundant life. That's what he wants for you. And it's right there. It's a free gift. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to, to walk on your knees for a mile. You don't have to say a hundred Hail Marys. I'm sorry for my Catholic friends. It's a free gift. You've just got to turn around and take it. Bow your heads, church. Heavenly Father, we just come to you in the name of the church, Lord. <clears throat> Is there anything harder, Lord Jesus, in 21st century America than, than being resolved to the truth of your word? And yet that is the first step, dear God, to true freedom. We've got to know the truth so that that truth can set us free. And so, Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone in this building and everyone watching me online, Lord, that we will know the truth and we will stop being guided by our feelings. We will stop being guided by our own education or by our own thoughts, Lord Jesus, but that we will, once and for all, turn to the truth of your word, dear God. That is my prayer, Lord. Bless these people as they go in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Amen.